people are getting settled, um, I'm Dylan Voorhees with NRCM, and I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, very briefly. Their, their full bios are in the program, so I won't take time to, to read them at length. But uh, starting on your right is David Critchfield, uh, and David has uh, been an environmental, environmental management uh, consultant for many years, and he is an operating partner with Atlas Holdings, which is an owner of Twin Rivers Paper in Madawaska, and he's going to talk about that. Haley Flint Gilman is the Associate uh, Chief uh, Legal Counsel for First Wind. Next is David Littell, who is the Commissioner with the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, you've met and heard from Bob Purchaselli from the EPA uh, previously. And Alan Cunaholm is a principal with PDT Architects and the president of the Portland Society of Architects. Uh, and as soon as people have their chairs, I think he may be the first one to offer some remarks. So back to you, Senator. Well, I think, I think what we're going to do is have short statements and then uh, go, go from there. Yep. We'll start with the architect. Well, thank, you very, thank you very much. And I want to thank you for your, uh, your record in championing the environment. I think that's very important to me. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be an architect right now in the state of Maine. Technology uh, has come back to benefit us. And I couldn't agree more with Charlie and what others have said that uh, collaboration at all levels is absolutely critical to uh, uh, reducing our, uh, our dependence and really becoming more energy efficient, efficient with our buildings. Buildings uh, contribute a uh, take a lot of our resources, both with electrical usage, our waste, the creation of materials, shipping them, um, and, it's, and it's just huge and it's underestimated. Um, a number of years ago, uh, when I first came to Maine, I, I came to Maine because of the quality of the air, and I think the quality of the air is right up there with lobsters. I would say that is our brand, and that's where we want to be. Uh, a huge portion of the stock of buildings in Maine were built prior to 1970, and as architects, we work on these buildings every day. They have no insulation. Uh, and we think the very first place to start is making our buildings the most energy efficient they can. So we, as architects, that's where we have to be. Um, and I uh, invite you to go uh, to Architecture 2030 that was started by Edward Mazria, the efforts of the American Institute of Architects, the main chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, and I also want to put a plug in for the University of Maine system. We have our first School of Architecture, how important that is for us in the state of Maine. Uh, another thing I want to mention, Portland Society for Architecture. Uh, we just had our waterfront visions this last fall, and we really wanted to get this dialogue about climate change uh, as it relates to Portland and Commercial Street. A lot of our economy is generated from our coastline, and in Portland, Commercial Street is hugely uh, valuable to us. It's a working waterfront. We want to maintain that. It's taken us a long time to get to this place. As you come in the front door, to the right, there are a number of boards that are laid out there on the table, and we commissioned a study that was done by folks from the Muskie School that showed what is, what is the risk for us in the city of Portland in 2050 and also 2100 for a 100-year storm based on sea level rise information. Uh, and I invite you to take a look at that. Um, it's, it's a challenge for us, and it's something that we have to start talking about now to come up with an adaption plan and not wait for a Sandy. Uh, there's also the Boston Resiliency Plan there as an example, but the Portland Society for Architecture has really tried to maintain this dialogue. And most recently, the Urban Land, Inst Land Institute was here, uh, which was Portland and South Portland, that did a study on Commercial Street along with South Portland. That report should be coming out in about a month. Uh, and we look forward to that. And what's come out of that is two panels, one that is really going to look at the data regionally for us, and uh, another panel that is going to uh, make policy recommendation, recommendations to our communities about how we should go about adaptation. So I would say, uh, as architects, we have a uh, we are, we are taking leadership, and it is critically important uh, for all of us to uh, think about conservation and think about our investments. Thanks, Alan. Uh, well, Senator, I, I gave a 10-minute 
talk earlier, so I'm not going to repeat it, but I, didn't, I did talk about you a little bit, and I wanted, now that you're here, I want to talk about you again, and thank you for your uh, Tell leadership. Me if he says the same thing. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can look at the film, I think, on that. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I, we were just talking, and I was reminded about the fact that I, I worked with the senator, then governor, back in the 90s on the original Ozone Transport Commission that began the whole regional cooperation in the Northeast, and Ned was a key player in that. I was the Secretary of Environment in the state of Maryland, sort of the, and you see how Maryland is part of Reggie. There's a little skipping in between, but uh, there's still that camaraderie between Maine and Maryland, uh, bay, states uh, that live on crustaceans and, and, uh, and, and begin with an M. Uh, <laughs> um, but you also reminded me of the amazing legacy of of leaders in Maine when you mentioned uh, Muskie and Senator Muskie and, and his leadership in the, in the environmental movement uh, uh, back in, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And it's something for uh, all of us in the United States to be proud of, but also for Mainers to be uh, incredibly proud of uh, what has happened in this country since that time. So thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership. And I'll wait for questions. Slides. Senator, yeah, they, uh, I wasn't going to do slides, but Dylan said, why don't you do slides? So <laughs> here we go. David Littell, the Maine Public Utilities Commission. Um, a little bit more than sure. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, first off for, yeah, that's the first one. Um, Reggie, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is a very informed crowd, but for anyone who was grabbed off the street and said, come on in, hear about market-based greenhouse gas control programs, and actually came in. <laughs> The greenhouse gas program that we have is nine northeastern and mid-Atlantic states, um, Maryland and Delaware up to Maine. We bound it together, actually starting in 2005, letter from Governor Pataki, then Governor of New York, set it off. Majority of Republican governors just at that time decided to move forward, along with Governor Baldacci in Maine, to set up the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. On that bipartisan point, I want to know my fellow Reggie director, Patty Ajo, is not here. Um, nor um, is Governor LePage, obviously, but if you talk to them, whatever you might have to say to them, I would note a note of appreciation for staying in Reggie and strengthening Reggie. The bipartisan consensus in Maine um, on Reggie has continued. So the way that we run um, is that we auction off carbon allowances every quarter. We just finished our 24th auction and just announced $5.02 was a clearing price a few minutes ago. So 24 successful auctions very successful market. Our market monitor has never detected any evidence of market manipulation or of the market working incorrectly. Now that said, um, one commodity analyst said, not the most exciting market, um, which is fine with us. We're not out to create excitement for commodity traders. Okay, enough said. On to the next slide. Um, this is NRCM's slide because it was better than my slide, so I borrowed it. I have a couple of their slides. What this shows is overall greenhouse gas emissions for the state of Maine and overall economic growth. Similar structure for all of the Reggie states. If you look at our economy, there's actually an article out today that looked at our economies. They concluded that our economic growth is stronger in the Reggie states than it is in the other states. And whether that exact analysis is entirely accurate or not, the point is, by designing smart programs, working with the business community, working with utilities and the power sector, We've designed smart programs that have decoupled any economic regulation from the cost of pollution reduction. Um, and that's important. It's important to continue to do that and work with our business leaders, our regulators, to continue that trend. Next slide. Independent review was undertaken of just our first three years of operation. An expert group um, out of Boston called the Analysis Group was retained, um, set up a bipartisan um, group to oversee it, look at the study design. Some of the utilities were represented. We were not represented. They, um, they kept it away from us, which was frustrating at the time, um, until we saw the results. The results came out and said that just from the first three years of operation for how we dedicated our allowances, um, and this is on the economics, not on the pollution reduction, just the first three years of operation, they expected over the life of all those measures to create a net economic benefit for our Reggie states of $1.6 billion and over 16,000 job units. Um, so it works economically. Um, as well as as an effective pollution reduction program. Next slide. Um, overall cost, by the way, if I mentioned, if you just look at costs isolated from those benefits that I cited, um, the costs are a little bit less than 1%, maybe half a percent on average across all of our states. So there is a cost, but if you design the program well um, and moving forward, 
you can design the program so that your benefits will vastly exceed the cost. So how do we do that? Well, in New England, we've dedicated the largest percentage of all the Reggie states to energy efficiency. And in Maine, we just did not just that, but through the Efficiency Maine Trust, the director, Michael Stoddard, is here who does the hard work in figuring out what programs to fund and what individual projects to allocate these monies to. Overall, about 40% of these revenues have gone to large-scale industrial and commercial projects. Why? That's where we can get the biggest bang for our buck in pollution reduction, in energy savings, and in reducing the bottom line for businesses to compete in the global marketplace to sell the products here in Maine. We're reducing their bottom line energy costs. Very important. Second largest share to the commercial um, energy projects overall. So about 70% of our proceeds are going to reduce bottom line expenditures for Maine businesses. And what does that do? Well, it reduces, obviously, their expenditures. It also creates macroeconomic benefits for the economy overall. So you get a double economic benefit. You're reducing the cost of doing business, you're keeping money in the region, and you're stopping the outflow of resources from the region to purchase fossil fuels that we don't produce in most of our states in the region. Um, and then residential programs, 26%. So that's how we've allocated our revenues and how we make Reggie work. These are overall benefits. Again, this is um, from, the, from the NRCM who took a look at this most recently. If just the first five years of operation, about $31 million funded through the Efficiency Main Trust, creating almost nine times that economic benefit over the lifetime of the measures. So that's sort of Reggie and how it's been working. Next slide. We evaluated, so it's a proven model. I mean, this is the argument we made to EPA. It's cost effective for reducing greenhouse gases. It's actually economically beneficial for our region. Um, it recognizes the regional nature of the electricity grid. Electricity flows all over New England and between the Northeast. Um, and it's very easy to keep track of greenhouse gases because we measure them when they come out of the stack. Um, so those are the arguments we made to EPA to allow Reggie to continue as a compliance method. We appreciate the fact that EPA has allowed that in the rules, so thank you. Um, and we're still looking at the details of that. Okay. Um, it works so well, together with a lot of other measures, as well as straight market responses to the price of natural gas, that our cap that we set initially was a lot higher than actual emissions were. Emissions are down over 40% in the Reggie region since 2005 already. So we've achieved, through a variety of measures, over 40% reductions. Because of that, we looked at the cap and said, the cap really isn't much of a cap anymore. So we, all nine states, um, all the governors, the legislatures, um, main legislature, decided to reduce the cap, to bring the cap down to current emissions. So we reduced the cap to half of what our emissions were in 2005. Going forward, this revision will not only reduce additional greenhouse gases, but it'll enhance those economic benefits that I talked about before. Our modeling shows that we'll get about $8 billion in gross domestic product for those states to be increased and generate over 124,000 job years now. An economist, I respect um, Dr. Colgan's opinion. Those, if you look at it from a macroeconomic perspective, they may be negligible, but it's a lot better that those gains are positive than negative, is all you can say as a regulator. Okay, next slide. Um, because we work so extensively within the region and within Maine with our business community and the affected um, companies, um, when it came time to make comments to EPA, our region operated very differently than the other regions. Utilities in the rest of the country um, submitted comments to EPA that may not have been all that supportive of moving forward. We had a lot of our utilities and power sector and environmental groups submit joint comments asking that Reggie be allowed to be the compliance um, mechanism for our region. And again, EPA is allowed for that, which we appreciate. Thanks. So there's another cost beyond, beyond the cost of just paying for Reggie. The bigger cost is that greenhouse gases are affecting what happens here. And if you look at increased extreme weather events, you'll see that there, more of those are happening. And if you look at a slide of weather-related outages of the bulk power system, it goes up precipitously. So um, those costs are real. They're affecting us now. Um, and this is another way to make very marginal um, improvements that are very modest to address the problem. So again, we appreciate um, EPA moving the ball forward nationally. Uh, First Wind is an independent renewable energy uh, developer, owner, and operator, and our footprint is national. We have wind energy projects out west uh, in Hawaii. We're constructing in Texas right now, and um, we have a, a big footprint here in the northeast, especially Maine. Um, we've also recently 
um, started to head into the solar energy space, which is very exciting for us. We have a project operating in Massachusetts and several more in the development pipeline. Our headquarters are in Boston, but I am lucky enough to be based here in the Portland, Maine office with about 20 colleagues, and we have about 20 more out at our projects um, around the state. Uh, the EPA rules from the first wind perspective underscore what we really know as a company from experience, which is that converting, um, developing new renewable energy resources is the, the most cost-effective, fastest way to reduce our carbon emissions. So we're very excited about um, the rules, and we're very excited about the flexibility that the rules have built in so that different states and different regions can work out solutions that work for them. Um, we obviously do a lot of business in the Northeast and in the, in the Reggie states. Even within that footprint, each state has a slightly different approach. So, so that flexibility, from our perspective, is critically important. One of the, one of the best parts um, about, about working in the wind energy industry is uh, the moment like this where I get to talk about the benefits. Um, so I've, I've brought my security blanket, so I, don't for, I try not to forget any of them. There are a lot. Um, our experience in, in Maine has been um, fantastic. Industry-wide, about $2.5 billion have been invested in wind in the state of Maine. And um, if you look at the projects that are in the pipelines and have been announced, there are three to five billion dollars of investment ready to go in the next five years or so. So there is a lot of economic activity that we get to talk about. Um, the, the dollars from these projects flow through Maine, in particular, um, in, in really three different ways. There are community benefits, direct community benefits. There are property tax benefits. Um, and then there are construction and supply chain type benefits. So I'll talk about each of those briefly. Uh, the main law requires certain community benefits on a sort of per turbine basis for these projects, um, and it's it's a minimum. These these community benefits can uh, are kind of locally designed, so they are targeted to fit the sort of particular requirements and interests and needs of the host communities where these projects are located, um, and these are not these are not token benefits. Um, we have a project Bingham. Um, 186 megawatts that's in the permitting phase. The, the community benefits associated with that project will be about $7 million a year, which in um, that region can have a really large impact. Um, the property taxes are similarly substantial when you look at these projects um, and, and can make a really big difference. Our communities have been able to repair roads and invest in other infrastructure projects by um, improving their staffing at the town level and address a lot of kind of critical investments that would not have been particularly possible um, without the investment of the wind industry in their area. Um, again, looking at sort of the, the Bingham as an example, the, the tax, the property tax impact is expected to be about $2.1 million a year for that project. Um, in some ways, though, the best part of the story is the construction and supply chain part of the story. Um, using the Bingham example, it's about $145 million of, of spending in those areas, and about $35 million of that is in wages, um, is how that sort of trickles down. And, and in our experience in Maine, our company has worked with about, um, when we last checked, we, over 300 companies across the state. All sizes of companies, all kinds of companies, every county in the state. Um, and so people have really kind of developed an expertise in this area. People have found niches. There are all kinds of great stories. Um, people who have developed tiny shops where they have invested in specialized equipment for washing turbine components, which is a key part of the construction process. Um, turns out the garden hose doesn't end up doing the task. So companies spring up to address particular needs w related to these projects. And then, in some ways, the most exciting part is these companies have an expertise that they can export to wind development in other states or other regions, or to new, to new um, parts of the, of the economy, like offshore wind, or even in the first one case, like the solar space. So these, this supply chain, this level of expertise that we've been able to develop in Maine, um, there are many of you in the room, as I look around, who can speak to it um, from a personal point of view. 
is, is really a huge part of the story about what this whole policy shift, um, what it has meant for Maine to be out in front on renewable energy. Um, so the economic benefits are substantial. There are also energy benefits, which um, are changing so rapidly that I wanted to point to them. Um, wind energy, largely driven by developments in, in the wind technology itself, has become incredibly competitive. And I just want to make sure we underscore that point. The cost of wind energy has come down since 2009 like 42%. The change is staggering. And what we have seen in study after study done by places like the state of Massachusetts when they're considering whether to do pure procurement of new renewable resources, they, they, are, they are concluding that for every, for instance, in this recent procurement, for every megawatt of new wind that they contract for, they estimate that their customers, their ratepayers, are saving a million dollars for every megawatt. I mean, these, these savings are substantial over the lives of these contracts. Um, so that story has changed tremendously recently, and it's a huge opportunity and another way that this region and the state has been way out in front on this issue. It's very exciting to see. Um, and of course, finally, there are the environmental benefits. Um, again, using Bingham as the model, the, the, the carbon um, emissions expected to be saved um, annually from that project are 228,000 tons. So for the environmentalists in the room, that might mean something very concrete. For some of the rest of us, it just sounds like a lot, a whole lot of carbon. Um, but in, again, studies, one study commissioned by the Maine Public Utilities Commission to look at the economic impacts, um, London Economics ended up fixing uh, a dollar amount on those carbon savings um, and actually concluded that the, the carbon, the sort of environmental benefits were really about twice what the property tax impact was. So these are, these are significant savings and, and discussion about the sort of property risks infrastructure risks, health risks associated with carbon emissions. Um, there's a lot of interesting work out, th work out there that has really tried to fix the sort of in economic impact of those, of those um, numbers. So we are, um, as, you know, as so many have talked about, we are in a region that has been way out in front um, and the results are powerful. So we are excited to see what um, these EPA rules can mean for areas that um, are looking for their own ways um, to solve these environmental challenges. Hi, good morning. I'm David Critchfield. I, uh, I'm sort of standing in here for actually a very strong team up at Twin Rivers and uh, in some ways also sitting here for Maine Pulp and Paper as well. Um, Twin Rivers, as uh, some of you may know, uh, was Fraser Paper at a time. They went into, went into bankruptcy. Uh, Brookfield Asset Management acquired them. Uh, we, in this past year, stood, stood back in front for uh, Brookfield. And um, I think the Atlas team and uh, Blue Wolf saw what many of you in the room also know about Maine. I mean, it's, it's about people. And uh, you can look at assets like this anywhere in the country um, and they'll all look just about the same, but in the case of uh, this operation, and, and I should say that Twin Rivers really is more, more complex than actually just Madawaska. Really, Twin Rivers represents a uh, pulping capacity in Canada, and uh, the paper mills in Madawaska, and a sawmill also in Canada. We, uh, we don't take second seat to anybody on uh, presidential permits either, because there's actually a presidential permit in place in Maine to make sure we can convey pulp, steam, white water back and forth across the St. John's River. Um, so as I say, I'm sit sitting here for Tim Lowe, uh, Phil Nado, a very strong engineering team who it wouldn't be right to say fortunate. They were disciplined enough uh, back in the 2010-11 era to put, uh, put several very uh, sturdy proposals together uh, and uh, match up with an equally sturdy organization, Efficiency Maine, and earn uh, two, two awards, and these will just be sort of example giving in some ways, because this, this is uh, Efficiency Maine gave out uh, some of this Reggie funds, and we put it, we think, put it to very good work. 
Um, two, just to use an example, and as Hallie said, I won't bore us all with numbers. I was specifically forbidden to talk about uh, cavitation in control valves uh, when I talk about one of the projects, so I'll, I'll jump past that for our lecture. Um, uh, we uh, implemented what's called uh, variable frequency drives, 37 of those, which to the tune of about $600,000, and that, uh, that, without getting into horsepowers and hectares, that ends up uh, basically dropping about 3,000 tons a year of CO2 equivalents out of the mill budget. Um, when I asked Phil, uh, so about how many more of these projects do you think you've got online? And he said 172. I said, don't you mean kind of like about 170 or 150? You don't know. I have 172. So this is the kind of engineering discipline that, that uh, Twin Rivers and, and certainly other main uh, pulp and paper engineering teams bring to this effort. The other project was a, kind of an interesting thing about pulp and paper or steel or whatever industry category you want to think about it as. And this is sort of the, the citizen on the street doesn't quite get this until we get to a blackboard. Luckily, we don't have a blackboard or I'd go to it. Um, is some of these things come and sort of think of it as lumps. I mean, uh, the other project was a significant drop in steam demand, and that meant figuring out amongst these 172 projects, if you will, the, the, the next generation, how many of them do we need to get together into one bundle so that we can drop steam demand in the Madawaska side by 40,000 pounds per hour? If we could only drop it by 30,000 pounds per hour, we ended up still having to run a boiler on the Madawaska side, still having to use oil. So we couldn't take that boiler offline. So the team was able to sort of, over, with a lot of work, uh, and, uh, and it was, these are young men and women that I'm extremely impressed with. I spent part of my career with international paper, and we had massive corporate resources, uh, uh, engineering divisions located in Mobile and Cincinnati, and they were dedicated to servicing a group of mills. Well, this is a team of people right there in the Madawaska facility, which is, to me, it's like a remarkable thing about Mainers. They don't sort of say, where's corporate headquarters? They get right down to work. They found a way to pull 40,000 pounds an hour of steam demand out of the Madawaska mill during the winter months, which is not an easy thing to do, and that enabled us to basically offset uh, approximately um, I think it's like 11,000 tons per year of CO2 demand, uh, generation capacity. So pretty, I mean, pretty extraordinary work. As I say, uh, Phil and the team have got 172 more projects that they have got to do the sort of the next bit of bundling. As you, it's not just like throwing it all up in the air and hoping Efficiency Maine gives you that grant. You've really got to figure out how you get projects that earn their, earn their payback, if you will. Um, the, the other thing, I, again, without drifting into a blackboard discussion, is main mills face kind of an interesting dilemma when it comes to capital expenditure, and this is why Reggie and Efficiency Main are so important here, is you can think about capital expenditure as kind of as almost like three buckets. There is the bucket that is in the front row, and that is the bucket that helps you make your product better, helps you stay competitive worldwide, helps you make it run more efficiently. The second bucket is the energy efficiency buckets. It's where you really can make the mill energy budget more efficient compared to your competition. The third bucket is sort of all the, you know, none of the above. It's everything else. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way the world pulp and paper markets have been, we usually have filled up that first bucket, and there's not a lot left for the second bucket. So really, capital that's available to the mill has to, you know, they can match that 50-50 but it's always gonna be a fight. So that sort of a way of thinking about how an industrial operation thinks about their life, they've got these buckets to juggle capital in and there's just, capital is short, that's, a, that's all there is to it. I can't match Senator King's story for story by any means, but I have one interesting story and this is sort of a example of how, again, Mainers and, and the Atlas Blue Wolf team thought alike in this regard, was the minute the, um, the, minute the transaction closed, uh, Atlas sort of likes to throw in a, in, into the room kind of an exploding balloon. They say, what would you guys really like to do to figure out how to do things better at this operation? And one of the, um, one of the good sharp engineers who's been working on odor control actually on the Canadian side, that's where the pulp mill is, that's where the odor is potentially. This is, these are, this is a sulfite mill, it's not the same as a craft pulping mill. Said, we need to find out how to do better, we need to see what the competition is doing. So, this kind of relates back to coal a little bit, because we, we took a trip in the beginning of this year, first quarter, to uh, several mills in Europe, 
European mills are very open. They don't, they don't like you to take pictures, but they are happy for you to wander around the mill as much as you want. And we went to three mills, two in Austria, one in, um, one in the Czech Republic. And the, one in the, the, the Czech Republic story and one of the Austrian mills is the one, I guess I'll just leave you with this and um, turn over the microphone. It was stunning in this regard in that we went to the Czech Republic mill, obviously it's former behind, this, behind the Iron Curtain, so you were in a very, very disciplined place. They would not let you even take out a camera. Uh, and it had the, the mill was what I would consider, I've been in the paper industry, industry since 1982, it was, I pictured it as like a Soviet era showcase mill. I mean, I've never seen a front office or a tidier operation in my life. Uh, but that wasn't the remarkable part. The remarkable part was the mill manager looked, uh, looked us in the eye in the introductory meetings and um, said, I want you to, when you, see, when you look at operations, I want you to tell me what you think is missing. And, and when we got to the back end of the, of the uh, site visit, one of my colleagues said, um, so how are you powering your boilers? He said, well, they're natural gas. And I said, when did you put that in? He said, well, that, was, uh, that happened by, by demand or edict at the government level. We were using coal up until December of last year. And that site you see out there was a coal pile. It's gone. We switched over in 2013. No, no questions answered, no questions asked. It had to happen. So the Grotkorn mill went from sort of 60 miles an hour to a standing stop and changed gears that fast, which, which just was remarkable to us. Second and last uh, sort of anecdote that really made our team sort of sit back and think we've got things we can do differently is one of the Austrian mills was in a little town called Lensing. Um, and this was a, also a sulfite mill. They make something called dissolving pulp, which we, we won't go to the blackboard on that either. Um, and uh, they ran a waste treatment plant. And I'm, a, I'm an environmental professional all my life, as, as, um, as he said, uh, that had the annual operating cost to run this plant and, tr and generate uh, treated effluent of six, $16 million per year. So the Austrian, this Austrian mill is spending approximately $16 million per year to treat its effluent. Um, our entire waste treatment system in Madawaska and Edmondson combined does not capitalize out at $16 million a year. It was sort of remarkable the discipline they had about how they would sort of squeeze everything out of the effluent. They were actually generating uh, usable product from their effluent. And um, it just it showed our, our team that there are miles to go, but they are achievable. And we will, uh, we're going to head in that direction. Thanks. I've been to that mill, and, and it's one of the great mills in, in Maine. And it's, uh, of course, the unique thing is it is, in, is, it, is, it is in two countries. There's a pipe that crosses the river. And it's always fun to visit Canada. I don't know if you, do you know the definition of a Canadian? A, a Canadian is an unarmed North American with health insurance. Uh, so anyway, uh, David and Bob, I wanted to ask you, it seems so obvious sitting here in the, in the wake of the new EPA rules and Reggie, is Reggie a model for the country? And uh, are other people talking and learning and uh, from what, I mean, it's been, your graphs are stunning. I think uh, EPA, my understanding is allowing us the option, us being all the states, of adopting a Reggie type model. First of all, if any states are interested in joining Reggie, we're happy to speak with them. I think um, we'd sort of ask, let the politics play out in DC, some lawsuits before we see how some states are going to move forward. But we do have encouraging sort of um, informal conversations with many other states. Um, we certainly think it works. It's shown that you can have economic benefits and achieve cost effectiveness by creating a large market and achieving the cost reductions, the greenhouse gas reductions. Could, could, lowest, other states lowest, join, could other states join the existing REGI or do they have to start their own? They could. We're clearly, we're open for membership, but I think, um, I, having heard from some of my colleagues elsewhere in the country, they think that it might be more politically palatable to do their own regional version of Reggie. And in that case, we helped California set up their system. Um, California is now up and running very strongly, and we're happy to provide whatever technical assistance to any states in describing how Reggie works, invite them to join. And um, it's, certainly, it's certainly a potential model that they could use. Bob, your, your thoughts? Um, 
Well, the, the section of the Clean Air Act that you mentioned that um, Leon Billings wrote about, um, uh, the former staff person for Senator Muskie, was written to uh, set up states doing plans. Um, but we see no prohibition in that of allowing states to join with other states when they do their plans. And I'm, I'm being at a very high level. So this enabled us with that interpretation to make it clear in the rule that places where states have joined up, the individual state plans could be the aggregate of those. And so we think that the success of Reggie has helped us visualize that, uh, not to mention the fact that the administrator was involved with it when she was uh, in Connecticut, but it might have had some impact, I'm not <laughs> sure. But, um, but the other one is that other states are talking to each other. There are conversations going on, even in the Western Governors Association, about how they might do it. And you know, we're, we're going to end up probably having to look at can pieces of state plans be interstate versus all of them. And, and so we're going to be open to a lot of comment on that. We think it is a really important um, approach to take. We didn't think we could mandate it, you know, but we could keep the door open for it. And I think that's probably the right place along the lines you were saying, how you do regulations. We, we want to make sure that people can do it. I think as time goes on, even after we start implementing it, perhaps, that states will begin to see some of the efficacy of joining together with their partners or in different parts. The other thing that's going to be pretty, pretty important is looking at the way electricity moves around the United States and how energy conservation and energy efficiency work. Where does the credit go in the state planning process? If we have electricity going from one state to another, being generated in one state, going to another state, and that state uh, uh, invests in energy efficiency, where is the credit, even though the emissions reductions are in, in another state? So there's going to be an inevitable interconnectedness here that is going to continue to, to uh, be apparent. So our role right now, as you have mentioned, is in our proposal, is to make sure everybody knows that this is something that can be done, and we've tried to write how it can be done, and we'll learn more from the comments. But I think it is a really important strategy, and I think Reggie has been a leader. The Northeast states have been a leader in the country in showing how it can really be an effective, an effective tool. Let me, let me ask a, a final question to Alan. Uh, you mentioned the, our old housing stock. I think Maine has the oldest, oldest housing stock in the country. Uh, does this mean that a continuing obligation, if you will, or at least opportunity for, for all of us is reinvestment in winterization and are new buildings being built to a higher standard generally? Ab absolutely. It has to be on all fronts. Um, you know, it used to be that we do a brick building and and that was it, and you would pump the, the oil into it, and because we had plenty of oil and it was cheap. Uh, but there are, we now have buildings that are costing $5 per square foot for utility costs, and we're able to achieve under a dollar a square foot. Um, and these are uh, uh, site utility costs. So I think there's a lot of efforts to be made there, and having a level playing field, especially when it comes to an energy code, uh, because it, you have to do both. I don't think it's fair to take credits to subsidize if we're not doing as much as we can in our own backyard. And we're very good at that. And I think we need to um, broaden the base and make it a level playing field. I, I, I will identify, and I'm, I'm sure I know David is well aware of this, a, a, a looming issue, which is transmission of energy, both electrical and natural gas. Uh, there is a, a very serious problem of, of tr pipeline capacity into New England. We sit right next to the Marcellus, but we can't get the gas. And last winter, there was a huge spike in price from $5 to $100 or, for a period of time, which is, which is going to reflect itself in, in bills. By the way, here's another prediction. Electric bills are going to go up in the next six to eight months. People are going to blame these regulations, even though they haven't. Uh, but, but they're going up because of the, trans, the transmission problem of natural gas. And as wind is developed in Maine, there's transmission problems of getting that wind power out of Maine. So those are issues that you know, we've got to be thinking about. And you may say, well, we don't want more natural gas. Well, the alternative, if we can't get enough natural gas to po provide our electricity, is going to be to run Cousins Island more. You know, there's no free lunch in this business. Every, everything has consequences. And, uh, but 
the shortage that we had last winter, we, we were, it, I met just this week with the head of I, ISO New England, and uh, the shortage last winter was, was, we were close to the edge in terms of, of generating capacity. And uh, so, uh, you know, I throw that out, Lisa, that's an issue that, you know, we all have to think about is, is uh, the regulation of the development of infrastructure. I want to say something about the transmission because I think that's a really important question um, and, and observation. Um, and others will have some, obviously, uh, some thoughts about this. But um, when we built this flexible uh, rule, we've been talking a lot about the states and the plans and can states join together. But inside what the states would have to do it are four basic building blocks. One is making the existing plants more efficient. We, we, we can do to power plants what we've done to automobile engines and turning them into in the electronics that have made automobile engines more efficient even, even as, as, as we uh, use them today compared to what they were in the 1960s. And some of that kind of automatic technology, you know, smart blowers and things of this nature can make power plants more efficient and can squeeze another six to nine percent depending on the plant out of those plants. So that's the building block number one. Make the stuff you have that's generating electricity as efficient as it could be. The second building block is we have excess capacity of natural gas and we don't use wind that we have built already all the time. So the idea is to move the electrons from that capacity to where it where it's needed more efficiently. So I, I don't know the exact number what we're Maybe if we use the existing natural gas capacity in the country somewhere around 60%, perhaps maybe it's a little less or a little bit more. I'm not exactly sure on the exact, so don't quote me on the number. But our rule says, well, let's move it to 70%. Now, somebody may say, let's move it to 80%. You know, that, there's, but in order to do this, pe people who have to, to put the capital together to build the transmission lines are gonna, and who have the product that they want to move to the place where the capacity is, Senator, they're going to see this signal as, as a way that the, the capital markets are going to start looking at those investments and pipelines differently is our aspiration. And so the third building block is more low uh, or zero emitting um, sources like renewables or nuclear and, and, and certain approaches that we were, we're looking into on biomass. So the, the idea there is sending a signal to the investment in the in the renewable portfolios that many states have already adopted. And then the, the fourth building block is one we've spent a little bit of time talking about here today, and that is the energy efficiency uh, component of it. How do you take your existing utilization of these electrons and be as efficient as you possibly can be? Huge capacity to improve that in our country. So what we did is we looked at those four building blocks and we applied them to, to the state based on the conditions that are in the state. And that's how we got, that's why you see some differentials in around the country and why inherently the Reggie states get to take advantage of what they've already done because when we apply those four things and they've already done some of it, the differential is a little bit different. So that is what we really did here. And, and so where you start counting from, whether it's 2005 or 2012, I'm not gonna say it doesn't matter but um, we used 2005 to talk about this a little in the many ways because of the international discussions. We've committed as a country to get 17% from 2005 to 2020. This rule along with the automobile rule and other trends in the economy are gonna get, our, get us to 17% by 2020. Um, what now is gonna be negotiated is what are we gonna do by 2030? That's what's gonna happen at the Paris meetings next year and so we, have, we show that. And so, the other, last point I'll make about investing in this transmission, both electric lines and, and, and pipelines, is we're trying to provide a timeline here that will provide the ability for states to look at how, and, and capital markets to look at the investment. This is something that, and this may disappoint some, that is going to get implemented in three years. It's going to take some time to make these transitions, and we want to provide the space for the investments that's, that's needed. I'm gonna, I, this, this is, these are really important questions, and it's important to understand that um, uh, trying to take them into account has been a, an amazing three-dimensional uh, chess game in trying to create a flexible uh, rule. And some others may want to talk about. Uh, 
Isn't it nice to have regulators that are as smart and perceptive <laughs> as Bob? Uh, I want to thank our panel, not only for what they did for us this morning, but for what they do in their daily lives. That's right. Uh, for the architecture and the, and the renewable energy, the uh, work at the, at the mill, for the work in the regulatory agency, and the work in, uh, at, at the PUC. Uh, by the way, did you know that the day after these regulations were announced, China announced that they're going to put a cap on carbon? That's a big deal. And, and that's the answer to the critics who say, well, it doesn't matter what we do here in the United States because nobody else, you know, we've got China and India. The only way we can get them to move is if we show a little leadership ourselves. And I think this is exactly where we are. So, um, thank you, Lisa. And one last word is I think it's wonderful to have the Natural Resources Council and the Chamber working together, that's such a good message, and uh, it, it, it says something great about the state of Maine. Thank you all so much, and wonderful to be with Big you. Big hands for everybody here. Let me just say, don't forget your postcards. There's gonna be a comment period on these rules. We'll let you know when it begins, and that's your opportunity to weigh in. And please have another muffin. We'll be around for a while. Thanks so much for coming.